Hello, hello, welcome. What a glorious day, another one. Wow, are we lucky. I want to introduce Rebecca to you. I bet you know who she is, but she's got credentials you should hear about. She represents Windsor Orange II in the Vermont House of Representatives, where she's on the House Appropriations Committee. Hmm. She has served as a teacher, a district leader, and Vermont Secretary of Education. She also taught education policy and leadership at the undergraduate level and graduate level, including at Dartmouth and Boston College. Her doctorate is from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and her business degree is from the Simmons School of Management. She's also a business owner in Vermont. We're really excited to have her today. Please welcome Rebecca Holcomb. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me, or is that, ooh, got a little echo there. Thank, he's adjusting it. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. If I go too fast, raise your hand, because I have a problem. And it's because I used to be a middle school teacher. And if you have middle school teachers, you need to stay ahead of them. And I've been told that you're an active group, you're going to ask a lot of questions, and you are serious. So I've taken permission from Cindy to kind of geek out today a little bit, so I hope you'll roll with me. And I know about people who sit in the back row, so I'm because I used to do that. So I've got my eye on you, and I'm expecting some hard questions at the end. Thank you for coming here. Um, I'm impressed. Ooh, I have to get Travis to turn it down. Is that better? All right, usually I'm too soft. <laughs> um, I love public education, and I'm just going to be upfront about that. And you can appreciate this beautiful picture of some children from Winooski from a couple years ago, because this is why we're here. And I love public education because I am here because of public education. And I've gone to all kinds of different schools. But when my family needed a safety net, when they needed something to give them a fair chance, public education showed up for them. My grandmother was a foster child. A couple generations later, I was secretary of education. That's what America and that's what public schools can do for people. They find you where they are and you give that chance so that you can give back to your community. So I am a big on public schools, big on community schools person. Just getting that out right at the start. That doesn't mean that I don't think we've got some challenges right now. And I know people who are in South Burlington, you kind of struggled on your tax bills this year. And you're probably a little worried about where things are going. I will also tell you that most of the public school people I know are really tight with dollars because they know they have to make every dollar go as far as it can because they're the ones who have to look members of their community in the eye and ask them to support the schools. And it's really hard when you're sitting at a town meeting and someone's questioning how much you spent on pencils to say, don't worry, we're just going to buy them. Because people do care. And right now in Vermont, when costs are so high, people are kind of worried about whether they can live here and whether they can afford to really stay in our communities. So I want to start off by saying I know that. And I'm going to give you some examples of what's going on that help you understand how we got here. So I'm going to do three things today. And I give you some high level information about Vermont that led us to where we are. I'm going to talk about some of the specific things that made this year hurt so much. And I know it hurt in a lot of communities. And I'm going to talk about some of the things that we can and we should do to address that so you don't have this problem moving forward. Because I know many of you have grandkids. I know you care about this state. And I know you know we need to do the best we can for these kids and kids like this across Vermont. But I also know that you've got limits, too. And we need to work to respect and honor how much you're giving and use those dollars as carefully as we can to take care of those kids. That's why we're here today. I wanted to give this, I hope you can roll with me a little bit on some of these data displays, but if you want to know why we're here, you have to know some things about how Vermont is changing. This is a pretty complicated chart, but I'm going to explain it to you. Um, and Cindy told me I could do this. The green line is 2010. 
the orange line is 2020, so we're kind of in between the orange and the red right now, and the red line is where we're going to be in 2030. What you see is the number of people in each of these age cohorts. So these are school-age kids, and blue is people in the workforce. And when you see this data, what you know flat out is that we are going to have fewer kids in our schools. And this is the baby boomers. Baby boomers are starting to move out of the workforce and retire. That means a couple things for Vermont that are shaping everything we're dealing with now, from housing to health care. And when you look at this data right out of the gate, you know there will be pressures in schools because there'll be fewer kids in the same building. And if you have to support the same buildings, but for fewer kids, that means you're spending more for every kid that you serve. And unfortunately, kids don't come and go in neat cohorts of 25. They come and go in ones and twos. So you can't cancel an art teacher because three kids left your class. You still have to keep those programs. That's part of the cost pressure. On the other end, when you look at this, when you think about the fact that we have the same basic total population size, but we're a lot older, your houses may be like my house. My kids are gone. They've gone off to college. They're living by themselves. My house used to hold four people. Now it holds two people. So we have the same number of houses and apartments, but our families are smaller because we're an older population. That means that we have a housing crisis because the same housing stock in smaller households means we don't have enough homes because every home has fewer people in it. And because it's so tight, it's very difficult for families with kids to move here. And that's creating this accelerating decline in young people. And that's hard because the parents of those young people, they're not just kids in our schools that bring down the cost. They're also the parents who you know, are the nurses at the hospital, or the doctors, or the people who clean our teeth. So we have this real problem here we have to deal with. In the context of that, this is our job. And I'm giving you pictures of kids to remind you why we're here, because <laughs> we care about them. But our job is to make sure every kid has a fair chance, because like my grandmother, who was a foster child, if you take the time to invest in her, she will have the skills to grow up and support herself, no matter what life throws her way. That's why I'm here. But we also have to get the greatest value out of every dollar for our, ch our children in the state. And we have to do it in a way that doesn't burden communities. And I am hearing right now from people across the state, seniors on fixed income, young families trying to get started, anybody who's working, basically, that right now it's really hard to earn enough and to have enough to be able to keep your house and live well and thrive in our communities. So we have to, we have to look at that. We can't turn away. What's, why is this happening? We all are dealing with inflation. I have to throw in a little light moment here. Inflation isn't just affecting your pocketbook. I heard someone a minute ago talk about how expensive groceries have gotten, how expensive everything seems to be. That's true for schools, too. And I know that, um, We've been having this data tour by the current Interim Secretary of Education. She's talking about how much spending is going up. Well, spending, the actual dollars we spend are going up. But if you adjust for inflation, and that's what this slide is showing you, we are spending more in actual dollars. But when you account for spending, your school districts are actually cutting back. They're trying to hold spending back. And they're actually spending in real dollars a little less than they were. It's just not dropping as fast as we're losing students. But if you watch, for example, the, the South Burlington school budget, you saw your board making cuts. They are cutting programs. It's that inflation that's underlying the challenge that they feel. We also are choosing to spend on different things. And I shared this slide to help you understand where our cost is, but also where some of our opportunities are. And this is from National Day. This is a little complicated, so you can tell me this slide doesn't work, and I'll take it out. But I actually think it's really interesting. Because if you compare Vermont, which spends a lot on education, to Massachusetts, which is the state with the highest performance, per, you know, student performance overall, 
there's some interesting patterns in how we choose to spend dollars compared to Massachusetts. And when you look at Vermont, we spend less on instruction. Now think about that. If we're spending less, proportionally less on teaching and instruction, think about what's going to happen to kids. But we're spending more on support services, things like mental health, food in schools, all those things that help kids feel safe and clean and stable and know they're OK. And we're really spending a lot more on administration. So we tie up a lot of every dollar in administration. And if you think about that, every school, and we have, we have I think, about 58 schools in the state that have fewer than 100 kids, every one of those schools that has its own principal is spending a lot more of every dollar on principals than every school that has 350 kids in one principal. And we have that, that dynamic. So because we're so small, and we try to do everything in those small units, we actually are spending quite a bit on administration. That's money that is not going into kids, and that's something to think about. With respect to social services, part of the reason we spend so much is because in other states, the state budget picks up things like mental health. In Vermont, our mental health agency is really struggling, and it's been underfunded. And so what's happening is that demand for mental health services is coming back into the education fund. Doesn't mean kids don't need it, but should that be paid off a property tax? Those are the kinds of conversations we need to have. So what else is driving up? I talked to Cindy and she said a lot of people have been talking about their tax bills. So I'm going to give you a couple examples of what drove that 15 cent increase in your tax bill this year. Because these are things that we can address. How many people followed what happened in Burlington with their high school building, right, the PCBs? And that triggered statewide an initiative to look at levels of PCBs in school buildings. Here's the problem. Despite mounting costs, we're testing for PCBs, we're finding PCBs everywhere, and guess what? We have not figured out how to get rid of PCBs, so after we fix it, we spend even more money to try to fix it we're not able to get ahead of this. So we have created a situation where every school district, including places like North Country, that had to have school, uh, students start school in tents because of PCBs, that was after they'd spent millions of dollars on remediation. This is a liability we don't yet know how to get ahead of. We're finding more PCBs, and we have no idea how to get rid of them. But kids aren't allowed to go to school in those buildings. This is part of the big increase. You tell me how the legislature was going to cut that at the last minute. It's a challenge. We've got some real issues here. Another big issue that I'm sure you've thought about, how many people have been following what's happening to health care costs in the state of Vermont, right? We just approved a 20, up to possibly 22 to 25 percent increase in some of those plans. School districts have had health insurance premium increases of at least 15% for the last three years. So if you're spending 15% more on health premiums every year and the cost of your plan has doubled since 2018, it went from about 17,000 up to about 36 right now for a family plan, okay, that's going to drive your budget up. Can you control that? They don't even negotiate health benefits at this local level anymore. So there's not really anything your school districts can do about that right now if they have to have a certain number of teachers and those health care premiums just keep going through the roof. And that's what we're starting to see statewide. And what we should all be looking at, blue is Vermont, is not just how fast our health care costs are growing, but how out of proportion they are to the rest of the country. Health care premiums in Vermont are now the highest in the nation. We are a small state. We have very modest pocketbooks on average. We can't afford this. And this isn't just in your school budget. This is in every single state budget. It's in every single business budget. If we don't get ahead of this, we got some problems. So we have to address this. Another thing, cost shifting. I got into this early because it's really been on my mind. Um, but we know that this year alone, this past year alone, about 50 million, a little bit less, of the increase in total spending this year, which is about five cents of your tax rate, was on mental health support services in schools. Our kids are hurting. They are really hurting. And there's a lot of things driving that. Um, many of you are 
aware of what's going on with the hotel program. We expect to unhouse over 200 kids in the next couple weeks. These are school children who will be living in tents in the woods and trying to go to school. That's what the data tell us. This is a slow-moving disaster that has huge implications for children. Because when those children are struggling, what's the last and only safety net in place left to help support them and give them a fair chance? It's the school district. It's why school districts now hand out clothes. They connect kids to health services. They provide mental health support. They provide food. Some schools offer three meals a day. And if we don't spend that money, if we don't build that child right from the start, we're going to service the warranty for the rest of their lives. And those children will not be strong, they will not be healthy enough to be the workers we need and the members of our community who build the bright future Vermont needs. And that's why schools are picking this up. And Doug Racine, who is from this area, who was former Secretary of Agency of Human Services, said part of the challenge is we haven't taken care of the State Department of Mental Health so all of this cost is falling back into schools, which are the payers of last resort. Again, schools have to provide those services if students need them. If we want to address this, we need to ask the governor, what are you doing at the Department of Mental Health to make sure that we're taking care of parents and families so they can take care of their kids? And those are the questions we need to ask. A last one that is very hard to talk about in Vermont and which most people in Chittenden County aren't even aware is an issue, is the issue of vouchers. And for years, Vermont districts that were too small to have their own schools paid tuition, and it used to be to our historical academies, which were public schools with private governance. So they might have been nonprofits, but they had a public mission and they were accountable to their sending towns. More recently, we have started to expand where the state of Vermont spends and pays vouchers in many communities, particularly more rural areas. I had someone in Windsor County mail me an excerpt of the Project 2025, which talks about the goals for education. And a lot of the things were, you know, expand universal vouchers, you know, allow private schools to not serve kids who are LGBTQ, um, book banning, all of that stuff. A lot of that stuff is actually happening in Vermont. So we can talk about it as something somewhere else, but it's actually happening here too. And it really matters because if you think about it, if the Ed Fund is a bucket and your property taxes have to help fill that bucket so we can pay for schools, because that's a shared resource, every time we punch another hole in that bucket and let kids take tuition dollars, we send kids to London, we send a kid to Thailand, we've got kids going to a prep school in Canada that doesn't take students with disabilities, we send kids to a religious school that is currently suing the state of Vermont to say, you can't make me comply with non-discrimination statutes when I take your tax dollars. Should we be funding programs like this? Because as long as we are, it means you all have to pay more to fill that education bucket, which is leaking like crazy. And that's why I'm talking about vouchers. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, because I tend to find that people in Chittenden County don't know this is happening and don't know the impact this has on support for public education. So I'm going to step back a bit and say, if you look at the research on vouchers, because this nation is in this moment of vouchers, the Republicans are running on an agenda for universal vouchers, and we have a number of states that have expanded statewide vouchers, including nearby New Hampshire, which is desperately trying to stuff it back in the bottle because the costs have gone up so much. But when you look at what the research from other states and other countries says about vouchers, we, there are a few things we would predict in Vermont. First, what we know now from years of research is that vouchers have amplified segregation. And we have to be honest about that. That's happening in Vermont too, and I'm going to show you what it looks like. And you can't support this and say you aren't supporting segregation as well, because the data is now clear. The other thing, people like to say, oh, well, why do you think vouchers make everything more expensive? Because their tuition is only 15 and the public school is 17. Here's the difference. If there's capacity in that public school, every single voucher in that area 
is excess cost. If you think about it, look at what's happening in South Burlington right now and Rice Memorial High School. This isn't a commentary on whether they're great schools. They're probably both fantastic schools, right? But the issue is if students who used to go to South Burlington are now allowed to take their tuition dollars to Rice, that's money coming out of South Burlington. It's students coming out of South Burlington. And when that happens, guess what happens to the tax rate in South Burlington? Right? And think of how South Burlington's been struggling to get those athletic facilities built and fixed. Meanwhile, Rice is getting a lot more money now and is building new athletic facilities. We are expanding the infrastructure we have to support. And if we are going to support more schools through vouchers, we are also committing ourselves to spending more and spending more on sometimes schools that don't work for all kids. Once the state privatizes, We've seen in other places, Florida, look across the country, it can't protect civil rights. Because the way the Supreme Court is starting to redefine the First Amendment, it used to be protecting you from compelled support of religion. Now it's saying the state can't for reli force religious actors who get taxpayer dollars to comply with non-discrimination statutes. So when we do this in Vermont, when we fund a school that refuses to enroll families who have LGBTQ parents, refuses to enroll LGBTQ kids, refuses to hire teachers who are LGBTQ. You're paying for that. And think about the conundrum. Think about the impact on public education. We say we don't want harassment and bullying. We say we want to protect all kids. But we're compelling taxpayers in the entire state to fund hate and homophobia. That's a tough thing for me as a Vermonter because We've been pretty good at a state about saying we're all in this together and we all matter. So that's one of the challenges we're going to have to deal with here in the context of Vermont. The last one is we've seen nationally in the data that vouchers don't actually improve learning. And on average, as vouchering increases, as you go to these statewide programs, you tend to see declines in student performance and outcomes get worse. So the question for Vermont now that we are starting to see this incremental growth in vouchering, it's very small, but it is expanding. And as we start to see the state put pressure on schools cutting you know, budgets and closing small schools, we're likely to see more of it if we don't make some changes. What are we going to see in Vermont? What's the future of Vermont look like? And we have little hints of that in some of our data. And this is data that hasn't been shown yet. I just managed to get this from the, um, the Agency of Education. Um, and so it's kind of interesting because it's starting to speak to some of the ways that we're changing. I said earlier that vouchers concentrate disadvantage in public schools. This is data on the number, the proportion of students who are vouchered. This comes from the Agency of Education in three different contexts that have IEPs. Those are students with disabilities. And you know that a couple years ago, Vermont said if you are, want to be eligible to get a voucher as a private school, you have to be serving kids with disabilities. So the good news is many of these schools did not used to serve students with disabilities at all. They just said, sorry, we can't help you. Go someplace else. Doors closed. Boom. The four historical academies, those are the big high schools, Burn Burton, Thetford Academy, St. Johnsbury Academy, that used to be um, more public and have always had that public mission. They, they are serving students with disabilities. In 1991, we made them independent schools, not academies. So now they're really similar in operation to these schools, but they're set up to serve students with disabilities. And here's what's happening in Vermont public schools. You can't look at this data and not say that towns that pay vouchers are dependent on nearby public schools, on average, to serve the, their, children with students, their children with disabilities. Because all of these kids, a disproportionate number of students with disabilities in voucher towns are relying on a nearby public school to serve them. We're all in this together. And think about the impact of this on those schools, right? You're, you're concentrating people. It also happens with economic disadvantage. Um, these are, this is data for students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch, or whatever marker the Agency of Education is using for economic disadvantage. And again, what you see is that the historical academies, historically, have been more open 
to, um, to students who are economically disadvantaged. They're bigger. They're often able to provide better support services. These other schools are not serving the same proportion of students who are economically disadvantaged. But this is shocking. We've expanded vouchers, and increasingly, vouchers in Vermont are middle class or upper middle class subsidies. We're, we're doing the reverse of everything we say we're trying to do around equity in our funding formula. We changed the funding formula so every kid would have a fair chance, but instead, we're concentrating the economically disadvantaged kids in public schools, and we're sending the privileged schools uh, kids other places. And this, by the way, doesn't even include the kids who go to Phillips Exeter Academy, who go to London, who go to Canada, a school in, to a school that doesn't serve kids with disabilities. So this may even understate the degree of segregation. And that's a challenge. And I will say there is one of these academies that operates like a public school, it accepts all kids, it's a public school for the purpose of tuition, and they're experiencing the same thing public schools experience. So when schools commit to being inclusive, in this market model we have going, we're punishing the people who are inclusive to support schools who've opted, or people who've opted out on their neighbors. And that's something we have to talk about because the question is how long can we support that? Um, as voucher programs go, what we're seeing in this transition from 2015 and 2024, it's still a small number, but remember, schools on the other side of the state and in some of these regions are also very small. So that may not look big to you, but if you're a neighboring district, it's a big deal. And what we see is that the greatest growth is not in the academies, which are more inclusive, nor in the public schools on a proportional basis. It's in this new group of taxpayer-funded private schools that aren't big, aren't robust, they tend to be smaller, and they include the religious schools. That's where the fast growth is happening. There is a, yeah, there, there is a school, there is a school in Black River. They closed their public school because they said it was too small to be able to offer kids the right opportunities at a price taxpayers could afford. Uh, and then after they closed it and it went to tuitioning, a very small, even smaller private school uh, opened up. And it has only 15 students. It doesn't have any teachers on staff. It contracts for intervention. And it focuses robotics or Lego or something like that. But that's a program where we're now spending $300,000, $350,000 in a very small program on 15 kids that could have gone to Green Mountain Union High School, which is the nearby school. So again, if you think about if we could take that money and put it into a nearby school and get some scale, first of all, kids would have broader opportunities. But you know what? Everybody's tax bill would be lower across the entire state. Think of that bucket. We're all in this together. When people make that choice locally, we're all paying for it. I'll give you another example in just a second. This is the Bennington School District. North Bennington in um, 2015 made a decision, or maybe it was 14, made a decision to close it's public school, the Village School of North Bennington, and they flipped it. They reopened it as a private school. So before they closed their public school, all of their students went to their public elementary school. I'm gonna show you data from 16, and I'm gonna show you data from this past 24, um, so you can see how over time their spending has changed. So previous, prior to this, every single kid went to this school and it was about 109 kids in 2016, and previously these other kids, so it's uh, another 20 kids or so, had all been in the village school of ben North Bennington. So as soon as they closed the school, kids started to fan out, including to out-of-state private schools, so taking your dollars out and paying teachers who don't even work and live in, Massachusetts, in Vermont, and also to a range of other schools. This is what they look like in, th in 24. Okay, so you see what's happening. Um, now they're sending um, even more money to out-of-state private, uh, to, well, even more money to private schools. They've also picked up funding for religious education, which we didn't do any, and, and people always say, wait, how do we do that? Because we have a constitutional prohibition on compelled support of religion. Well, it does say that in the Constitution, but right now the U.S. Supreme Court is saying, tough bananas, you still gotta do it. So we're now paying for religious education, Again, these may be great schools, but should you be paying for this out of your property taxes? 
Do some kids have more choice in North Bennington? Yes. Now kids in North Bennington can choose from all of these schools. But that's almost half a million dollars more that they're spending that if all of those kids were reabsorbed back into the village school, which you see is now, a, where is it, a shrinking enrollment. They're losing their kids there. And if they were all reabsorbed back in, it would bring down their per pupil spending. When it brings down their spending, it brings down your tax bills too. This is the conundrum. What's good for them is actually bad for all of us. And we're going to have to have that hard conversation. Um, another issue that we're dealing with, I talked about uh, civil rights. This is happening in more schools than one at this point. But um, I mentioned this earlier because I got ahead of myself. But Vermont is no longer able to enforce its anti-discrimination statutes. And actually, we're now being sued by a school that is not just focused on tuition vouchers, but is also focused on school, school um, sports. But if we set up this precedent where people who take public dollars, public benefits, as opposed to public education, which is a public good, and are allowed to discriminate in accepting who they'll serve, this potentially has implications far beyond school. Are we going to get to a place where child cares decide who they serve, which is where we already are? because many of these programs have child cares. Are we going to get to a place where you know, an adoption agency might decide, well, it won't serve? What's hard to me as a Vermonter is, as a Vermonter, we are setting the stage for expansion of discrimination in our choice of education policies. We're gonna, we risk having Vermont the face of a lawsuit at the Supreme Court on this issue. And that's, that's very painful to me as a Vermonter, because for so much time, we have been very focused on, on equity. Um, as we increase the number of vouchers to private schools, are we getting better outcomes? You know, parents want the best for their kids. I support that. I mean, public schools have an impossible job because they have to give everybody a fair chance. At the same time, they're supposed to help every kid get ahead. Can't do both those things, right? But I understand why parents want the best for their kids. As we spend more money in these private settings, we know from the national research the data says that as you expand, you actually see a decline in performance. So what do we know about Vermont data? Not much, and it's hard to tell because we changed the test from the smarter balance to the cognia, and it's hard to make sense of what happened in that transition. But what we do see is even though the population of voucher students in Vermont private schools is bigger now than it was a few years ago, and it's also more privileged. So if you look at this, this is that difference between economically disadvantaged kids. And what you can see is blue is public, red is private schools. And this is the percent economically disadvantaged in each setting. Up until two, uh, about 2.19, you can see that the public schools had more students who were economically disadvantaged, but it wasn't quite so disproportionate. This weird thing happened in the middle here. I don't know what it was. <laughs> I was trying to forget it. <laughs> Called the pandemic. So we don't have two years of data. And what we can see is when we emerge from the pandemic, you can see that impact, that concentration of disadvantage that was sort of hidden in those pandemic years, that concentration of disadvantage in public settings. And typically in Vermont, students who are economically disadvantaged or have IEPs, they tend not to score as well on standardized tests. So when you see this, your expectation would be that the test scores in those private settings would be a lot higher. This is what we actually see in the agency data. First thing you notice is before the pandemic, some of these schools, and they were very limited, on average, the private schools had higher mean test scores. I don't use percent proficient. You don't use that if you understand small schools and test data. It's just not a good way to talk about test data. It's good to talk about scores. And what you can see is Public schools were slow incremental gains. This is just the ninth grade smarter balance assessment. When I talk about test data, I try to always talk about math because it's really the cleaner measure of what schools are doing because a lot of people read to their kids. Not many people do math with their kids. So if you want to know how the school is doing, look at the math scores. And I'm looking at ninth grade because that's the beginning of high school and it's where you start to see this transition. And what we see is that as the years went by and we emerged from the pandemic, 
they're, they're not really that different, right? So that big boost that everyone was saying we would get by sending our kids to private schools, that's actually not materializing in our own data. And we need to keep looking at that as we go on. So I gotta say, this is absurd. <laughs> if we are too expensive, if private schools don't really seem to be creating more better learning, and why do we make you pay higher taxes and force public schools to compete for public school dollars with, let's talk who we're benefiting, private schools in London, New York, Thailand, Sweden, Canada, other states, New Hampshire, prep schools. Private schools that don't serve students with disabilities and which steer disadvantaged students away. I actually don't think it's constitutional that we pay vouchers to places that don't serve kids with disabilities in other states because we're not giving them a fair chance. That means the child with a disability doesn't have the same choices as their friend who doesn't have a disability, but it also means we're taking away from them by diverting the numbers and all the dollars that would have given them the same opportunity set, and we're sending it off to a program they can never get into. That's not really fair, and it's really not constitutional, and it's really not the Vermont way. And also, should we be making you pay more to fund private schools that openly discriminate against kids, families, and teachers, which some of these schools do? I understand what they're saying. They're saying you're discriminating against my religion. There is an answer here. It doesn't have to be this way. We have a compromise solution right in front of us that allows those historical academies and the schools that truly have committed to following the same high standards as public schools and that are willing to function like public schools. It's called designation. And I gave the example of Thetford Academy. It's in, actually in my region. The town of Thetford has voted to designate Thetford Academy as its public school for the purposes of tuition. Every single kid there knows they can go to that school. You don't worry that because you have a disability or economically disadvantaged or because you're not a good fit or because you can't afford the application fee or because you don't have a good recommendation from your math teacher, you don't worry that you're not going to go there. Thetford is opening its arms to you. That, that's something we could ask them to do. The other thing um, is that they've agreed to follow all public school rules. And people often think, oh, standards are much higher in private schools. The reality is we have consistently updated the standards for public schools. We have very strong, robust, comprehensive education quality standards that specify what students have to be able to have access to. We have not updated the standards for private schools since the 80s. Don't have to take physics. You have to learn how to do arithmetic, but you're certainly not necessarily prepared for advanced STEM. And IT wasn't even something people thought about then. So we haven't got the same standards. But Thetford said that's not enough for us. We're committing to these higher standards. And it also includes select, uh, elected school board members. It's trying to make itself democratic by allowing the voice of the people in Thetford on its school board, even though it's a private school. So, at least this is an option that we know works, that some people have already chosen to do. And if you are a district and you are paying vouchers to a program that is discriminating, that's a choice. You are choosing to take advantage of the state and force people to fund discrimination so that you can have expanded options for your kids on the backs of other people's kids. Thetford chose not to do that and other districts could do that too. And I suspect this will come up in the next session as an option. So I'm gonna close so we have some time for questions, but the question you have to ask is do you care enough about cost and fairness to demand that we, the legislators and the governor, act on your behalf? There are things we can do. We can tackle healthcare reform. We can limit cost shifting from the state budget to school budgets. Think about those mental health things. If the state paid for it, it wouldn't be on your property tax. We need to address our housing crisis, because if families with kids could live here, then that would help and strengthen our schools. We need to leverage scale where we can. There are some really exciting opportunities. We've had a couple places where public school districts have merged middle and high school programs, and they've doubled the opportunities for kids, and they've cut their tax rates way down, and they're better than they ever were. So we do have to look at scale in all sectors. But you can't look at scale if every time you close a public school like the Black River School in Ludlow, 
and allow an even smaller private school to open up and take your tax dollars. You can't get to scale. So we have to make some hard choices here. Same dollars, same rules, and as I said, limit vouchers through designation. So maybe the right solution is one that makes us all a little uncomfortable because we all have to change a bit. But what we can do is guarantee a place where people can feel safe in their homes and not worry about losing their house, where kids know they've got a fair chance and we're looking out for them and their bright future, and where we can promise taxpayers we're making the best, smartest use possible of all of the dollars they send us. And if we do that, just think what we can do. Think of what we can do for the young people of Vermont if we give them a fair chance. I love this picture. This is a very rural high school, and this girl is testing, this is an airfoil, and testing the lift on the foil in a homemade wind tunnel that her school did. Doesn't take much, that's some serious ingenuity. Think of how if we look in these kids' eyes and we give them that chance, think of where they could take us. So I wanna make sure I save time for questions. Yeah. Thank you. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we can get a microphone to you so everyone can hear your question. Okay, right here. Um, you said so much, it's really hard to process. I'd love to ask you a question in an hour or so. But <laughs> immediately, one of my thoughts is you talked about designation, and I'm assuming that has to happen before you close the school. Well, so because if you... Such the, a good question. And a group of us fought very hard for that last session, including, is anyone here represented by Mary Catherine Stone? Um, she's in Burlington, she's in the area. A number of us pushed very hard that if a district closed a school, they had to designate a school so that we wouldn't get that fanning you saw in North Bennington. We did not yet have the support in the legislature to get that across the line. So write your legislators, Tell them you really hope they'll take seriously the prospect of designation because it's the only way we're going to put some boundaries on tuitioning in a way that gets us to scale. So because the state's been pushing consolidate, consolidate, consolidate. But that, the schools are closing, but it seems from what you're saying that it doesn't necessarily mean it goes to, students go to other public schools. Are you running? Because we need you. <laughs> I was Thank a teacher. you. <laughs> no, that is exactly right. And so there is no point in consolidating your school or closing your school if instead of merging with somebody else, you just send it out to the wind, like scattered seeds you know, all over the universe. I mean, again, we send kids to London. We send a kid to Sweden. That is not helping affordability. And if that is the alternative to operating a school, there is no affordability in the future of Vermont. That's exactly right. I, gee, I wish you could come explain that. <laughs> See, Cindy was right. This is a good group. <laughs> yeah. I live in the new north end of Burlington. And I am watching this uh, new school going up. And one of the things that frustrates me is that the Vermont Health Department set the PCB and other uh, toxic toxins levels at a almost impossible level to meet. And it is apparently, and I'm not exactly sure what the number is, but several times lower than what the national standards are. Uh, and so what is the legislature doing about that aspect of it? I mean, the legislature uh, can pass legislation to tell the health department to redefine uh, what is safe and what isn't. Okay. And of course, yep. what is safe? That's okay. another question. In the House, we tried. Right? It, it didn't make it through all the way. So talk to your senators on that one. And we'll keep trying. And part of the challenge is, y you know, one of the things that schools are dealing with, it's so low, it's proving very difficult to hit that threshold. People are spending millions of dollars on remediation, and they come back and the levels are even higher, right? I mean, here's another issue. Due to some efforts by the Senate Appropriations Committee, we not only are on the hook 
for remediation in public schools and these approved private schools. We're also on the hook for remediation in the recognized schools, which are the private schools that don't take state dollars. And if you go and look at that list, some of them have four kids. They're in people's home. What if you cook fish for dinner? Does that put you over the threshold? I mean, do you see the problem? Like, it, it, this is a potentially unlimited liability. And don't get me wrong, we know it's a carcinogen, but we are driving cost without any way to deal with the problem. And at some point, if we so bankrupt ourselves trying to fix this, we may lose the capacity to actually come up with real solutions. So the House has been pushing very hard. I think there's some new receptivity to pushing pause until we figure out how to move forward. You're absolutely right, I agree with you. And I'll be w working for that pause while we rethink how to actually solve this problem. You're absolutely right. There's one up in the front here. Oh, oh in the back. Is there somebody in the front? Nope, you go ahead. Uh, I had a question on your slide that showed economically disadvantaged students in public schools. Mm -hmm. I probably should have stopped you back then, but it looked like there were 80% of the students were economically disadvantaged. Am I reading your, your That's slide too, wrong? Uh, and I probably went through it too fast. That was the population of tuition students who are sent to that school. So what, what that says is, and this is data from the AOE, this is not my data, but what they're saying is that the students with economic disadvantage are being tuitioned or vouchered to public schools, and the students who don't have economic disadvantage are much more likely to be tuitioned oh, so, to private schools. So they're getting like transferred to a different public school? Is they don't have high school. So for example, um, uh, the town of Winhall doesn't have any schools at all. So they basically buy education from any surrounding school or out-of-state school that their families choose to go through, to. The students in that school who have, the, the students in that district, because they don't have a school, the students in that district who live there who have disabilities on average, the data suggests, are more likely to go to places with robust special education services and those tend to be public schools. The students who go to Phillips Exeter Academy, those are students who probably are less likely to need significant services for students with disabilities because, or economic disadvantage, or they wouldn't be getting there in the first place. But Did that I, answer your question? It's I think so. I, just the tuition, that's just a cross section of just, just tuition. It just students. seems like there's, maybe there's other hurdles for people getting into schools, like, you know, at, do they have tests to get into schools and things like that? You're absolutely right. In fact, California, um, in its charter school, see, Cindy, you're right. This is such a good audience because you're so far ahead. This is exactly the right question. California says that in charter school enrollments, the only thing the charter school is allowed to ask for is the name and the contact information for the guardian or parent. Because the empirical research shows if you ask for anything more than that, you discourage kids with disabilities and you discourage economically disadvantaged kids. So you're, you're actually suppressing, you're creating barriers to entry. That is an observable fact that has been demonstrated in research. Some of these schools, ask if you've ever gotten in trouble, if, you have, if you're getting mental health counseling, what your test scores are, what your grades are, you need three recommendations. All of those are barriers to open enrollment. And that is part of why, you know, if the public school says, hey, come on in, a lot of kids are like, I'm not gonna get those recommendations, I hated that teacher anyway. Those kids are all going to the public school. The other kids are the ones who are gonna end up applying and ending up in some of these private schools. Not all of them, Thetford Academy, open door, come my way to anyone. And so I don't want to say that they're all like that, but a lot of them are quite. I mean, you can imagine Phillips Exeter Academy. You don't just like walk over and say, I'm signing up. And then again, I'm not saying it's not a great school, but they would reject 99.9% .9 of Vermonters. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, there's someone up in the front who's been trying for quite a long time. My daughter's friend. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you for your presentation, it's really fascinating. I have questions on two slides. Mm -hmm. One, the bucket, the hole in the bucket. When did the rules change about where tuition dollars could go? Because I remember the day when Rice could not accept tuition dollars because they were a Catholic school. So mm -hmm. 
I want to know when and how, like how did that decision get made to, to, to send out all those tuition dollars? And then the other question is um, the, the slide with the Massachusetts versus Vermont expenses. So obviously the administrative cost expenses are high because we have so many school districts mm -hmm. because we haven't consolidated school districts. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we have more school districts than the entire state of Vermont. But nonetheless, I have talked to legislators about this and they say if you bring up consolidation uh, in the legislature, people from small towns go crazy or the people that represent the small towns go crazy because they say, no, 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 you can't close our school. That's our community center. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like those two huge issues are um, mm -hmm. diametrically opposed and... and yeah. Yeah. So, so, so many, so many things we could talk for an hour about each of those, right? And, you know, who, who, what was the saying, you know, uh, culture eats strategy for lunch? I mean, this, this is kind of the issue here. This is culture in Vermont. I want to go to the first one first, because that's the easy one. The easy one is we um, used to, we've always tuitioned. We changed the way we tuitioned in 1991. Again, these schools used to be called public schools with private governance. In other words, they had a public mission, even though they had private school boards. But everyone accepted that you'd go to TA, or you'd go to St. J, or you'd go to Burn Burton. And then they became regular private, nonprofit, independent schools in 1991 right around the time of the Milwaukee voucher project, like all this stuff happens at the same time. Since then, we've had a series of court cases. Um, there's been a lot of litigation, and people love to sue in Vermont, because actually our, we're not that good at defending ourselves, and our statute is pretty darn weak. So we're a great case to, place to make a case, right? And primarily, the suits are coming from two kinds of groups. One are sort of libertarian groups, who are very focused on individualism and markets and let's just break public schools and have vouchers for everybody. They've been suing that the only way to be fair is to give everybody the same amount of money and then let them fight for a place in a school. I don't happen to agree with that, but that's what they say. The other are big, big national, often Christian evangelical litigation groups who are spending millions of dollars first to privatize then once you've privatized, to say it's discrimination to exclude religious schools from your voucher scheme. So if you privatize, you don't have to privatize, but if you do privatize, you can't cut the religious schools out. That's where these schools began to be allowed to get um, you know, public dollars. And then the last piece of a round of legislation is the one that we're currently in, which is if you send these dollars to religious schools, you also cannot enforce your anti-discrimination statutes. They are redefining the First Amendment, and I'm sorry, elections have consequences. We're gonna have to live with this for a generation because this is where our Supreme Court is right now. That last issue is wending its way through, and as Vermonters, whatever we did in 1991, this is the country we live in, that's the Supreme Court we got, are we just gonna sit here and let them decide, or are we gonna step up and decide for ourselves? That's where we are. That was that question. Culture issue. This is a hard one. And I think people feel very differently about elementary schools and high schools. And everyone I've talked to in the legislature says the same thing. Young kids, first of all, they don't need the breadth and depth of opportunities. I mean, they don't, they don't, they don't need, they need literacy coaches. They need support services. They need a good teacher. But they don't need to have all the special opportunities, the multiple languages, everything that you really do need to have for high school kids. So I think there's two conversations, and we have to give ourselves permission to think differently about elementary schools and kids on buses and differently about high schools. When we look at the public school choice data and the tuitioning data, high school students travel a very long way. I mean, people are coming from the top of Grand Isle all the way down to South Burlington to get to, get this, big schools. They want big schools, that's what they say. You look at where the data goes, even in the private sector, the kids who are moving and tuitioning, they tend on average to have a preference for bigger schools. Think about why, if you're in a high school with 150 kids, you might have one math teacher, if you don't like that math teacher, boy, you are really in trouble, right? And so you think about that. How can, you know, someone, someone once said to me, um, well, you should just have the, 
the science teacher teach all the science subjects. Well, how can somebody who's a biologist really be the same teaching that AP physics course? They can't. So if you want robust opportunities, there is very good data that says you need bigger high schools. And my guess is that the work in the legislature is going to focus on the high schools. Because there's no question that if you combine forces in middle school and high school, going back to White River, they merged two very small middle schools, two very small high schools. They have one middle school, one high school now. They doubled the offerings. They now have two sports. So if you hate softball, you still got something to do. A kid like literally was in tears. She said, we can finally have a band, because before we didn't have enough kids and enough instruments to do anything but play by ourselves. They're thrilled. I mean, it is exciting. They are on fire. And you know what? It's affordable. That's the kind of visioning. And I actually think that Vermonters are very pragmatic. I was in a school district. We had three towns that were paying tuition and one town that offered a high school that was dying. It was too small. And we ended up voting to become a single district. And we put all our kids in that high school. We expanded it, better offerings. And we won that vote with 80% of the vote in all four towns. You know, Vermonters are smart. People are smart. They dig in and they resist if you don't take the time to sit and talk to them about what they're trying to do for their kids and whether they can afford it. But particularly at the high school, if you can make it a win, if you can show how working with that person is not that bad and might actually get you a lot, voters are smart. Like, they, they pay attention. They know taxes hurt. And they know kids deserve better. And we need, to, we need to trust voters to make those right choices. Where, and, but they also deserve to have good options, too, right? So it's hard. I'm not going to say it's not easy. It's hard. But we kind of owe it to our neighbors, and we owe it to our kids to have that conversation. Just a quick question. How many international students are we paying for? I had no idea that we were paying for students. Not to huge numbers of international students. It's more interesting to me that we're unable to turn off the faucet, right? Because you know, when it becomes a standard, then where do you go from there, right? And here's also why it matters. Even if it's not a huge number, I represent the town of Thetford, Thetford Academy. They made a choice to designate. They made a choice to do that, to make sure that high school stayed big enough. That's a high school of about 350 kids. And they knew that if they didn't send all their kids to that high school, that high school wouldn't be big enough to give kids a good set of options, and they knew it would be too affordable. So they're really trying to play by the book and do the right thing. Somebody in Thetford, a community member, emailed me the other day, and they said, hey, seriously, this other town, I won't mention the name, just voted to send a bunch of kids to you know, and they named a prep school in New Hampshire, and a bunch of kids to this school that's suing the state of Vermont so that it doesn't have to comply with non-discrimination. And they said, seriously, you're doubling my taxes to lower taxes so that these people can send their kids to those schools? That's why it matters. And that's, I mean, I changed the title of my talk because I actually am an incurable optimist, or I would never have worked in public schools, and I never would have run for a legislature. But seriously? You're going to ask people to spend that much more money so that you can fund kids in another town to discriminate? I don't think that's going to fly. People are, peop this is not what Vermont goes with over the long haul. People are going to see that, and they're going to say, come on, we can do better. Because those kids used to go to TA, and now they're going someplace else, and that's driving up taxes for all of us. We have time for one more question. Anybody? Oh, here we go. Can we revert back to 1991 regulations? <laughs> Is um, there any way to do that? There has been a bill sitting in the legislature for, um, to do something very similar for two years that didn't even get taken off the wall or a discussion. There's another bill that requires everybody to do what Thetford did. I think that people don't like to change, but I think we're getting to a place where enough people are saying, this isn't working, we need to do something different, that my hope is that there will be some discussion of those two options. It's hard to go back the way we were once we opened that door, but I'm hearing enough people say, you know, this is, this is absurd. We, we can't, we're not a big enough state, our wallet isn't big enough, and our kids deserve better, and frankly, it's not fair 
that I think we're going to hopefully see some, some progress this what session. Those bills be so we can oh, I can pass them back to you, the exact numbers. One was initially submitted, um, the way it works, it was initially, oh, I'm going to remember the name. I, I can't, I'm, I'm blanking on the numbers. Everyone talks about numbers, I think about the language of the bill. It's <laughs> clearly not. Not good at this. But if you if you want to send me those, I'll send them to you, and you can send them out. I'll put them out in next week's email. Does okay. That, does that work for you? One of them is um, is around identifying the criteria that private schools have to meet to be considered part of the tuitioning program, and it sort of narrows the field a little bit, and it has to do with things like did they have a vocational program. Are there teachers in the contract? Were they a public school prior to 1991? So it, it sort of, it's a backdoor way to get at that 1991 change. And the other one is a designation bill, which says that basically, if you close your school, and I, it, there's actually a new version of it coming out, which is why you shouldn't focus on last session. You could, should focus on what comes out next session. But there's going to be a new version of it that comes out that requires you, if you close, to designate. And that also says that every district, if you don't have a school, you got to designate no more than three schools to be the public schools for purpose of tuition. So you can't just do what North Bennington is doing and send them to 15 different places, including out of state. you got to pick three places in state. Keep, keep those dollars in Vermont. Invest in Vermont. Invest in our communities. Invest in people who live here. And let's just have the best, best darn state. That's what we need to do. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you all.